In September 1978, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin arrived in the US on the invite of the American President, Jimmy Carter. Nine months had passed since the breakdown in talks between the Egyptians and the Israelis. The relative isolation of the presidential resort of Camp David in Maryland was an ideal location for the talks. Camp David was a brilliant exercise of uh, President Carter. He understood the differences between Begin and Sadat. Uh, and he understood that those negotiations can go on and on and on and never be uh, concluded. So he uh, wanted to put the two leaders into a pressure cooker. Uh, they will be separated there from the media, from the political environment. They will be able to focus uh, on the issues of the peace treaty itself. But the talks got off to a bad start when Sadat laid out his peace plan to Carter and Begin. What happened, in fact, is that he at Camp David met Begin once. And he presented an Egyptian proposal that Begin rejected, and there was a some sort of a shouting match in such a way that President uh, Carter decided that uh, they should not meet again. Seeking to avoid any further unpleasant encounters, Carter and his team kept the two delegations apart and worked with each one separately. President Carter, for unexplained reasons, I don't understand until this very day, decided to separate each other, each from other, as if he were thinking that they can make war. Sadat stuck to his demand for a comprehensive peace agreement that included withdrawal from occupied Arab territories and recognition of Palestinian rights. Begin refused to be drawn on these issues and instead stayed fixated specifically on the issue of an Israeli withdrawal from Sinai. Objectively, Sadat had the weakest hand. I mean, Begin had the territory. Begin had what the others wanted, and he could always say no, at least to the Egyptians, and he could say no to us and challenge us to try to force him to make the concessions. The leaders remained locked away in Camp David. After a week, they emerged when Carter took them on an outing to the nearby Gettysburg War Memorial. The hallowed ground of the American Civil War battlefield may have provided a sobering lesson on the cost of conflict. But the deadlock remained when they returned to Camp David. On the Egyptian side, Sadat was the most accommodating member of the Egyptian delegation with a vision of peace that was strategic, whereas much of the delegation was seemingly more tough-minded but basically more preoccupied with short-range specifics. On the Israeli side, it was almost the opposite. Begin was by far the most rigid, the most unyielding, whereas some of the people around him were much more flexible. With the American mediators going between the Egyptians and Israelis, the talks dragged on. Begin followed a very devious policy, procrastinating, procrastinating, time, 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 time. Till the last moment, Begin didn't want to commit himself with respect to settlement in Sinai and so on. So uh, he was dragging his feet and Prince Sadat was under pressure. Feeling this strain, on the 10th day, Sadat decided to terminate the discussions and return home. So Carter went to see him and uh, he said, well, what's happening? Well, why are you planning to leave? And he said, I, I can't stay. I can't deal with these people. They're impossible and so forth. And uh, Carter says, you can't leave. He says, well, why not? He says, you can't leave because if you leave, it's the end of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship and it's the end of our personal relationship. This was detention diplomacy. Neither side was allowed to leave before an agreement had been reached. After two weeks of talks and under intense American pressure, Sadat and Begin finally reached an accord. 
The first part of the Camp David Accords provided a vague framework for a Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The second part of the Accords outlined a basis for the signing of a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. The treaty would stipulate Israel's full withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula, the establishment of diplomatic relations, and the guarantee of free passage of Israeli ships through the Suez Canal and other international waterways. The Accords put a restriction on Egypt's stationing of forces in the Sinai. The most sensitive issue of all, the status of Jerusalem, was deemed too controversial and was excluded from the Accords. Some of Sadat's own delegation were unhappy with the draft of the final agreement. We were not happy. We were not happy. We thought that we could get better, a better deal. Not that we, were, we didn't want a deal, but we thought we could get a better deal. So the, a president of a republic, any republic in the world, has to take certain decisions. He took certain decisions. We cannot afford... Egyptian Foreign Minister Mohammed Ibrahim Kamil resigned at Camp David. He felt Sadat had surrendered on essential points relating to the West Bank and Gaza and had left Egypt isolated in the Arab world. It was a big emotional trauma for Mohammed Ibrahim Kamil. Mohammed Ibrahim Kamil belongs to this generation of Egyptians who were brought up uh, by the ideas of the National Party, Hizb al-Watani. Kamel was the second Egyptian foreign minister in less than a year to quit in protest at Sadat's dealings with Israel. Despite the resignation, Sadat and Begin signed the Camp David Accords at a ceremony held in the White House on September the 17th, 1978. I was glad when Camp David was over that at least we got the Egyptians earlier. But I did not celebrate. I mean, I, in all honesty, I thought the other part, it's not going to work. I mean, as people read the fine print, Palestinians won't buy it, the other Arabs won't buy it. We're going to have a split in the Arab world. <laughs> The split was not slow in coming. People throughout the Arab world denounced the bilateral deal Sadat struck with Israel. Those at the heart of the region's problem, Palestinians in refugee camps and in the occupied territories, were outraged. They felt Sadat had weakened the chances of Israeli withdrawal from other Arab territories. Camp David. Uh, resolutions were a great disappointment to us Palestinians here because the outcome was only Sadat got his Sinai agreement, total withdrawal from there, but yet the West Bank stays as it is, under occupation. Regardless of Arab anger, Sadat returned to the White House in March 1979 to formally sign the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty with Begin. Israel exploded. People danced in the streets, celebrating the peace treaty with its largest Arab neighbor. In Egypt, Sadat returned to a hero's welcome. Sadat was a gambler with a grand sweep of history in his outlook and rhetoric, uh, willing to take chances. He took an enormous gamble in signing the peace treaty with Israel, but he got what he fundamentally wanted, which was all of Sinai, without any residual Israeli presence. Begin was also a man with a vision and a toughness, but ultimately also willing to cut the Gordian knot. He concluded in the end that breaking the Arab phalanx around Israel was worth the price of giving up all of Sinai. The Israelis implemented the first stage of the agreed phased withdrawal. In May 1979, after 12 years of Israeli occupation, Egypt regained El Arish, the largest city in Sinai. Sadat raised the flag over the liberated city, making a big event of regaining Egyptian land. 
The celebration was perhaps a message to other Arab leaders that gaining land for peace with Israel was a viable option. But whereas the Egyptians celebrated, doubts remained over whether the rest of the Arab world would follow Egypt's lead. <laughs> 